Hello everyone, and welcome to the Alchemy Iceberg. This is part one of a three-part series. I, I haven't even decided how many tiers are on the iceberg. You'll probably see that right about now. Uh, I just have all the terms listed. It's a combination of an iceberg I found online and a lot of my own terms. So this Alchemy series is actually a two-part series. The icebergs in and of themselves are the first part. And then an alchemy and psychology set of lectures or video essays I'll be doing is the second part. So I'm breaking the iceberg into about three parts I'll say, and the alchemy and psychology video will be up after that. I figured that since alchemy is such a really intense topic and you need a lot of background knowledge on it, it'd be really fun to do an iceberg video before I go into the more complex psychology side of it. So the beginning tiers are going to be more about the actual practice of alchemy, and it's just going to get more obscure and conceptual as the tiers go on. So I really hope you enjoy watching, um, thank you for clicking, and I'll talk more about updates at the end. So first off, we have alchemy. Alchemy has historically been practiced from east to west, China to Europe. Alchemy is an ancient natural philosophy seeking to turn various elements, primarily lead, into gold through various chemical purifications. This protochemical study balanced itself between philosophy and science, with claims of elemental purification far surpassing illustrious gold, leading to eternal life and curing of any disease. Elements in the human body could be perfected through the myriad processes of alchemy practiced. So yeah, first object on the first tier, it's gotta be alchemy. Um, as you'll see as the iceberg goes on, alchemy is such a broad, broad topic, and it's not necessarily going to be talking about lead to gold always, or if ever, that's a really minute portion of it. There's not a super defined set or genre of alchemy, but it's a huge body, huge corpus of work that a lot of ancient thinkers have looked at, and like I said, it's everything from purification of the body to purification of the soul, to using actual metals but trying to get these things that cure all diseases or the pill of immortality like we'll talk about later. But yeah, it's just a real general introduction. Next up we have Ouroboros. The Ouroboros is an ancient symbol of the serpent or dragon eating its own tail, an anthropological universal symbol found in western, eastern, and early South American cultures. The symbol is a sign of the infinite and self-creation of various processes, from union individuation to the universe's creation, death and rebirth, and so on. The Ouroboros has been used across many spiritual and esoteric traditions, but has been primarily used to denote alchemical works. Ouroboric symbols represent unity and wholeness, symbolizing the completion of the alchemical process and realization of the Philosopher's Stone. One creates it and realizes it through a self-contained system of alchemical transmutation. Ouroboros is... I've been waiting to actually talk about it because it's a namesake, a namesake of this channel, if some of you have realized that already. Um, the first part is Talos, uh, which is another Greek myth, and the second part is Ouroboros, which makes Talaboros. Um, so that's how you pronounce it, yeah. But Ouroboros in and of itself is a super cool topic. It's one of those myths that's found everywhere across the world. Every symbol, every civilization has it, and it almost always represents the same thing. This infinite, this wholeness, this completion. So the snake eating itself is symbolizing destroying and creation in the same zeitgeist, right? So while the snake eats itself, it's also creating itself, and that's where the symbol of the infinite comes from. It's also used spatially and temporally. It can be used to say that time is a cycle and self-creating self-destruction. When I said Southern American cultures, that's what the Maya used. They used an Ouroboros to represent that time goes through these great cycles that destroy and create themselves. And in alchemical work, it's used to denote the process of turning lead to gold. You're starting with materials and you're ending with materials. You're going through a finite material cycle and ending up at some place that's still along the same path. You're never leaving it, just changing the material aspects of it. So next up, we have the Quaternities. The Quaternities are four stages refers to the original colors mentioned throughout most alchemical works. Melanosis, the blackening. Leucosis, the whitening. Xanthosis, the yellowing. And finally, Iosis, the reddening. This was called the quartering of the philosophy. The Quaternity extends to physical properties of the process as well. Hot, dry, cold, and wet, along with four primary elements. Earth, water, 
fire, and air. These forms would be balanced and transmuted through various stages and combined through various chemical processes to achieve gold or the philosopher's stone. So the quaternities are something that's really, really prevalent within alchemical work. Uh, you might think it's all about lead and sulfur in these materials, but it has a huge part to do with earth, water, fire, and air, and the combination of each. There's a process of four that keeps coming up within alchemy. There's four stages in earlier works. In later works, they start to take out the yellowing, and it's just going from black to white to red. But there's a symbol of wholeness within that four and completion, the self-balancing, each balances each other out. And just as each balances each other out, it's kind of saying that once you reach the gold or the philosopher's stone, everything is in perfect accordance or perfect balance within each other. The four symbols, earth, water, fire, and air, each have opposites of each other. So it's fire and air and earth and water, I believe. Um, and the final process of the philosopher's stone isn't separating all those elements, it's combining the union of opposites, so it's taking all of the opposites and making them into one whole pristine matter, and that's the Philosopher's Stone, or the union of everything. And next up, we have the Sevenfold Graduation. The Sevenfold Graduation deals with the hierarchy of planetary houses, the greater or lesser relationships between metals and their celestial counterparts. In the lesser work, the ultimate culmination is the moon or silver, still a valuable element, but not the ultimate goal of the alchemical process. Thus, the greater work culminates with gold or the philosopher's stone. Each element is paired with the celestial body as follows. Quicksilver or Mercury as the planet Mercury, Saturn as to lead, Jupiter as to tin, Moon as to silver, Venus as to copper, Mars as to iron, and the Sun as to gold. The sign of Mercury is not a stage in the work but rather a key to the whole, so the work itself only has six phases. So the sevenfold graduation is also something that's really important, both theoretically and in actuality. The biggest part is that it realizes alchemy is a process-based endeavor. It's broken up into these little chunks, taking one step by one step, it's a fluid process, but it's broken up into little checkpoints almost, and there's a huge relation between astrology and alchemy. Each element is correspondent to a celestial body. We'll talk about that more. It's a mix between deeper symbolism and also just another way to correspond to elements. One thing to keep in mind whenever you talk about alchemy is a good quote by James Hillman. Alchemy is freeing the mind from literalism. So while there's symbols and correspondence, you can't take any of this literally. You can't take anything that silver is the moon. It, it's all just metaphors and I'll talk about that in later stages but that's really important. So next we have the philosopher's stone. The end goal of all alchemical processes, a prize awarding many names, the tincture, the powder. It bestows ultimate wisdom upon he who wields it. Alchemical accounts read, more perfect than the exhalation of gold, it is taught much about divinity. Generally the stone is a perfect union, like the Ouroboros represents of all four elements. It is often represented as a hermaphrodite, encapsulating both male and female in spiritual union. Through its various depictions, the Philosopher's Stone reveals a certain truth which cannot be seen with the outward eye. So already we're kind of straying away from that literalism that we're talking about. It's not actually about turning lead into gold, but it's more of a process of wisdom. While there's a lot of aspects of people actually trying to find lead and gold, much more people were looking for this so-called Philosopher's Stone or this penultimate wisdom that was found along the process. There's a lot of references to this across all cultures and across cultures that didn't have any influence with each other at the time, so that's a really interesting facet. It also breaks us from the outside world and starts to incorporate us to the inner world. It says that it's something that can't be seen with the external eye, but it's something that's realized within and teaches of divinity. It's also speaking about how this philosopher's stone has some kind of autonomy, some kind of self self-driving force, as if it's alive and it's a teacher. Uh, we'll get more into that later, but it kind of has this I alchemical idea that all matters alive and all matters one. So next up we have Isaac Newton. The profound physicist who went on to shape the science as we know it was deeply interested in alchemy. He had over one million writings relating to alchemy along with his own annotations on each work. He was interested in finding the philosopher's stone and his alchemical beliefs played a large part in his cosmogony. He believed that the aether was the mechanical principle which produced gravitation, often citing some active principle of alchemy that led to non-mechanical natural processes. He also believed matter to be alive and connected to the world soul. He was a man that's last of magic and the first of reason. As alchemy was outlawed during his lifetime, 
given the rise of fraudulent advisors to rich princes or businessmen who couldn't keep promises, so the crown banned alchemy and it was a forbidden practice. As such, Newton was forced to practice in secret, hiding from the world that he practiced or at least studied alchemy. Newton is a really, really interesting one because not a lot of people know that he practiced or at least studied alchemy. The really interesting part is that we're not 100% sure whether he was doing it materially or spiritually. While there's overlappings of both and he was obviously interested in for the chemistry, there are hints that he had a more spiritual aspect or a spiritual belief in it, especially when you're talking about things like believing that all matter has life and is connected to the world's soul, or that gravity is produced by the aether. He also had some ideas that alchemical processes could influence physics or physical properties, which is more spiritual than material. Some active processes could influence the way that reality was shaped. But like I said, he was denoted the last man of magic and the first of reason. He existed in a transitory state where Alchemy was still seen as a valid worldview, but it was starting to turn to empirical sciences with figures like we'll talk about later, such as Francis Bacon. These guys were changing the zeitgeist from more mystic, non-scientific based phenomena towards hard sciences and these chemistries. But regardless of what Newton felt either way, he was definitely involved in it because he had over a million writings on the subject. And next up, we have Freemasonry. Freemasons viewed alchemy as a means of internal perfection as opposed to a literal transmutation of gold. In Melusino's right, it is mentioned, chemistry is art and wisdom is nature, and the most learned chemist cannot be even a pupil among us. This represented the change from operative to speculative chemistry which arose in the 18th century, the brotherhood delving further into spiritualism as opposed to prior pragmatism. As such, Alchemy was used as a figurative guidepost to base Freemasons' progress. A quote from a Masonry article says, Today, Masons strive for perfection in ritual and in life itself, much like those ancient alchemists seeking lost knowledge to turn metal into gold. Obviously, at some point at the list, we're going to talk about Freemasonry because it's almost tied up in every single occult or esoteric figure today. Um, I couldn't find a whole lot on Freemasonry more than this. Um, I just know that they, like other philosophies or religions that we'll see, they use it as a figurative guidepost, so they're kind of basing their spiritual, internal progress against the transmutation of metals on their way to gold. This had a lot to do with Rosicutianism, which is something we'll talk about in tier 2. But another man adjacent to Freemasonry that we'll talk about now is Sir George Ripley. One of England's most famous alchemists, operating in the early 15th century, his writings were paramount to other alchemists later, like John Dee and Robert Boyle. Favored under the Pope and adored by the public, he has a larger-than-life mythology. Almost as if a post-hoc Charlemagne of the alchemical world, Sir George Ripley was said to give 100,000 pounds of sterling silver annually to the Knights of England and Rhodes against the Turks. His famous works include the alchemical wheel, each planet corresponding to a metal within the image, like the sevenfold graduation. While little is known about his actual life, he's made up to be an incredible figure. Yeah, Sir George Ripley is just one of those uh, mythological alchemy figures that you kind of get. They're, I don't want to say it, but they're almost like a dime a dozen. Uh, for every Sir George Ripley, you can find like 10 others that are famous alchemists that have a bunch of mythological figures. Because that's just what alchemy lends itself to. Turning lead to gold is wizardry straight up so you're gonna have these figures that are made out to be legends or donating 10,000 pounds of silver that they created in their laboratory that's not to say that he's not interesting i'm sure sir george ripley was a, a, a great guy uh but next up we have the homunculus homunculus literally translating to little people has been compared to the golem in jewish folklore it can be seen as another goal of alchemy, instead of the transmutation of material to material, the goal is to create life out of lifelessness, to imbue life into soulless material, surpassing the ordinary lead and transmuting it to gold. Paracelsus was a Catholic alchemist and the first to create the homunculus. This holds a similar sentiment to Christian salvation in the faith, creating life out of matter as God created us out of clay. And for these reasons, the homunculus has been compared to forming life out of clay like the Jewish golem. A quote from Paracelsus reads how to create the homunculus. That the sperm of man be putrefied by itself in a sealed cucumbent melon for 40 days with the highest degree of putrefaction in a horse's womb, or at least so long that it comes to life and moves itself and stirs, which is easily observed. After this time, it will look somewhat like a man, but transparent without a body. If, after this, 
it be fed wisely with the arcanum of human blood and be nourished for up to 40 weeks and be kept in the even heat of the horse's womb. A living human child grows therefrom with all members like another child, which is born of a woman, but much smaller. So yeah, I uh, hope you enjoyed reading, hearing about the homunculus as much as I did. Um, that's, that's alchemy for you. Yeah, it's kind of, um, like I said before, you can't take any alchemy literally uh you i don't know how you'd read that figuratively but you, you kind of have to because you're not actually going to be in, inseminating a horse but anyways more uh phil philosophically to get away from that it does have some interesting connotations because while we've seen the ouroboros used to denote a self-contained uh, process here we're seeing the imbuing of life which is a separate force from material into the work. Some alchemists, as we saw, like Newton, believed that matter was a lifeful material, or had some intrinsic connection to the world's soul. So, the alchemical work in this way can still be viewed as a self-contained process, it's just breaking the threshold of life or consciousness. You can view this as akin to rebirth, and the process of alchemy being an entire process of rebirth over and over again. You're not literally creating life, even though you could argue, like Newton and some other alchemists, there was already life in the material, so you're just bringing that out of it uh, at a more severe factor. But it can be viewed metaphorically as lead to sulfur or sulfur to tin. It's a rebirth. You, you keep creating new material, creating new life in that same material. In that rebirth, if you're looking at it from a philosophical standpoint, like a Freemasonry perspective, at the end you're recreating yourself, you're dying and being reborn as a more pure version than you had before. So now we have, my lights just changed, I hope that didn't mess up the lighting, but we have black, black powder or gunpowder as we know it was created by alchemist Wei Boyang the father of alchemy as he is known in the eastern hemisphere. He wrote of a material that would fly and dance violently. These led to major weapons advancements in the upsurge of what culminated in modern day firearms. This led to the patronage of Emperor Wu Han, who significantly benefited from the tangential discovery on his quest for eternal life. A quote on the matter reads, Some have heated together sulfur, real gar, and saltpeter with honey. Smoke and flames result, so that their hands and faces have been burnt and even the whole house has burned down. Yeah, uh, that's not a great thing to find in the quest to eternal life if something blows up in your face and you're eternally crippled, uh, but it was a cool discovery. There's something really ironic about uh, searching for eternal life and the elixir of life and then just getting blown up. That would suck. But black powder is really interesting because it's such a crucial development going into the modern age for us, and it was developed by alchemy. And if you're looking at it from a pragmatic perspective, it is unquestionably the most physically meaningful thing that alchemy has ever produced uh, from a material perspective. But yeah, there's not more theory to it, it's just an interesting anecdote. So now we are on to tier 2, but it's gonna get even more and more philosophical. Um, first up, we have the Pill of Immortality. Chinese alchemists from several centuries BC until near 500 AD pursued the creation of a life-prolonging elixir or pill known as the Pill of Immortality. This quest, often involving the transmutation of gold, was purported by the emperors and Chinese nobility, particularly those influenced by Taoist beliefs. The alchemical pursuit in China delved into two main schools of how to achieve immortality. During the Eastern Han Dynasty in the 2nd century AD, the school of the external pill, which focused on consuming substances to gain immortality, gained significant traction among Taoist sects. Around the same time, the practice of internal alchemy aimed at developing an immortal body within the physical one, a sort of metaphysical daemon through a combination of dietary, respiratory, and sexual practices, along with mental techniques like meditation. So this is one of those um, records that kind of blends the material and the philosophical, at least if you're looking at it from the external perspective, uh, a pill that can actually be ingested it's kind of acknowledging that alchemy is viewed as a psychological process, but it's imbuing that into the material. While you are actually going to be transmuting lead to gold, along the way, this is going to be addressed with some supernatural properties that will give you eternal life. Or, as the Taoists already saw, you could turn it into an internal perspective, and without the literal transmutation of lead to gold, you could still get that 
pill of life or pill of immortality. This was obviously really, really appealing to the Chinese emperors, and like we see with the next up character, Tao Wangjing, it led to some really interesting things. Tao lived during the period of Chinese division of the northern and southern dynasties during the 6th century, a polymath on various physical and natural sciences. British sinologist Lenol Giles goes as far to call Hong Jing the Chinese counterpart of Leonardo da Vinci. After serving as a court hand for a near decade, Hong Jing retreated to the mountains to partake in alchemical experiments, his patronage allotted to him by Emperor Zhao Yan of the Southern Qi. His journeys were spatial and temporal, plagued by spiritual visions of local deities traversing mountainsides over spans of four years. Recording his visions, the gods of Mao Shan relayed that his destiny was to become an immortal, and as such, he was to find the alchemical elixir of life. Drinking his tincture of ores and mushrooms, Hong Jing was poisoned by the excessive amounts of mercury and arsenic, core ingredients of the immortal potion. The phenomena was so common among alchemists, the term has been deemed Chinese alchemical elixir poisoning, claiming five emperors' lives alone in the 9th century. Hong Jing's work survived in a compilation called Master Zhu's Communication with the Unseen, a seminal work for later Chinese alchemy. Out of all the people we're going to look at, I think Hong Jing's story is one of the most fascinating, especially because of that last bit with Chinese alchemical elixir poisoning. Five emperors' lives within a hundred years is crazy. If you really think about it, that's like if five US presidents died trying to get a mortal life after the four before them had already died. I don't I don't know if the sixth emperor just realized that was a bad idea or, or how long it took, but that is a crazy statistic. His life is so fascinating because it almost reads exactly like the hero's journey. Um going into the underworld, coming back out, and instead of being pure, he unfortunately died from Chinese alchemical poisoning. I wonder how many non-emperors died from that. But I, I don't want to keep going back to it, but just such a, that's my favorite point. It shows how much belief everyone during this time period had that alchemy was something external and something valid. Almost every single emperor had their own alchemist to work towards this pill of life, and everyone viewed it as a legitimate practice. It would be for much later on, even into the European Renaissance, which we see with the next up, Al Alkahest. We shift our gaze to alchemy during the European Renaissance. The concept of alkahest emerged as a theorized universal solvent. The elixir was capable of dissolving any substance down to a liquid without destroying any of its fundamental components. Further, Paracelsus claimed that the solvent could fortify the liver and act as a substitute for its functions, showing early medicinal knowledge of the liver's filtering purpose. The pinnacle goal of total elemental reduction was to isolate the other's medicinal components expediting the alchemical work by inexplicable margins. Like all alchemical components, the existence and function of alkahest was greatly debated between practitioners of the time, some suggesting that lymphatic vessels of animals contain the solvent, while others saw it as a mythical tale. So the alkahest is, um, it's, it's definitely one of the alchemical terms of all time, because you got kind of something that someone just decided to make up because it'd be really convenient. They just thought, man, the whole process of alchemy is distilling things into their finest parts. But what if we found something that already did it for us? Realized everyone was like, yeah, man, this is no way this is real. But there was that one guy who was like, maybe. You kind of just forget that a lot of these were average or above average educated people. But because they're such ancient manuscripts that have been written for 800 years, you think of them as some authoritative figures, even though it's the equivalent of us of some guy just in a garage trying to make tesla coils it's it's pretty much like someone said yeah i found this uh this clay pot and if you face it west on thursdays it'll drop out gold pellets and everyone's just like oh my god this guy man then Clyde over here is just like no i seen it and then 600 years later you got someone making a youtube video about it and yeah they just <laughs> on top of it all they just said it was just inside of animals lymphatic system so that was Really cool. It's it's a really cool. I'm not trying to undermine the whole alkahest um, conspiracy. I think it's a really cool thing, but I I can't I can't talk about it anymore. So next up we got Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon was like Newton, one of the world's last magicians and first scientists. He helped pioneer the scientific revolution along with being the face of modern day empiricism. Without listing off his myriad anecdotal accomplishments, Bacon was one of the smartest men living during the 17th century. 
His intellect was so highly acclaimed that various theories pin him as the true author of Shakespeare's plays. Bacon had an interesting relationship with alchemy, declaring war on it in his Novum Organum. In it, he says, Man, the servant and interpreter of nature, only doesn't understand so much as he shall have observed, in fact or in thought, of the course of nature. More than this, he neither knows nor can do. He saw the alchemist as going beyond their means, seeking to quell the great spirit of nature, overriding man's natural subservience to the cosmos. That being said, filtering out the magical thinking impeding on scientific progress, he had due respect for the empirical chemical side of the work. His thinking ushered in the modern view on alchemy as a practice more superstitious than transcendental. Francis Bacon is a severe hater of alchemy. Um, he, he talks about how the magical stuff is garbage. He would not have been an alchemist fan, I can tell you that much. He, he really doesn't think there's a philosopher's stone, obviously. He's one of the great scientists of the 17th century that gets the scientific method going. But he had a lot of respect for the, the actual physical chemical side of it. Like I've said before, they did have actual creations like gunpowder. There were a lot of metallurgical processes that were learned throughout alchemy. So he did have respect for it because it was chemistry's predecessor. And as much as I wish there was some really cool like Francis Bacon was into alchemy and also he was Shakespeare and Shakespeare was into alchemy, I don't think I can get that going for us. But maybe next time I can pull something off, right? Um, so next up we have Hermeticism. A philosophical and esoteric tradition, Hermeticism is primarily based on writings attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, the legendary amalgamation of the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth. The core body of work deals with the cosmos, mind, nature, and how humanity can connect with the divine. The overarching themes of spiritual transmutation and ritualistic purification had huge impacts on alchemical work, especially going into the Renaissance. The core theory of Hermetic Alchemism purports that the material work is a guise cloaked in philosophical metaphor. The penultimate truth of transmutation is purifying the soul, not elemental material. Held with a certain esteem to the practice, alchemy is one-third of the three parts of the wisdom of the whole universe. This perennialist reading is a cornerstone in the hermetic thought that one same divinity and truth can be found across all religious and philosophical traditions, all various masked manifestations cloaking the one core truth. Hermeticism is fascinating, and I'm sure if you're into this kind of stuff you've seen a lot of hermetic work. I'm actually not as familiar with it as I'd like to be. Um, we're gonna go after a term right after this that relates to Hermeticism. But Hermes Trismegistus is this larger than life figure that's supposed to be the wisest man or in between God and man. Um, he's the equivalent of King Solomon in the Bible to Greek and Egyptian tradition. Uh, he's supposed to be the wisest man and more so he's the messenger of a wisdom, the messenger of the gods. So he's not someone that has his own autonomy, he's just delivering these higher truths through himself. But hermetic work was a big influence on the way that alchemy starts to play out. We started to see as early as Taoism, it's seen as a philosophical process. Hermeticism really got that rolling into the West, and it's re that started when it started to get really, really esoteric when you look at it that way. But they did have advancements on the physical side of it as well. Uh, if, as you've probably heard, hermetically sealed, if something is completely vacuum tight sealed, it's called hermetic sealing, which came from hermetic alchemy. So it was a really intensive process. So I'd like to learn more about hermeticism. Um, please let me know if you'd be interested in hearing more about it because I'd be, I'd love to do more videos on it. But uh, dealing with hermeticism in the same vein, next up we have as above, so below. A core tenet of hermeticism, akin to the idea of perennialist truth, just as across all religions and philosophy a single true theory exists, the idea is extrapolated to spatial dimensions. Within the Emerald Tablet, a seminal work of Hermes Trismegistus reads, That which is above is like to that which is below, and that which is below is like to that which is above. Scale is relative to the observer, but the same innate truths transcend size or lack of it. The same principle exists with an alchemical text, the following passage from an ancient Greek alchemical work. It must be completely round, in imitation of the spherical cosmos, so that the influence of the stars may contribute to the success of the operation. Alchemists were unlocking, as they saw it, secret universal truths within their practice, overcoming the temporal boundaries of nature, uniting the macrocosm and the microcosm, 
The processes that occur in the cosmos are reflected in human experience, directly influencing general activity. This is one of those really fun conceptual ideas within Hermeticism. Perennialists, I mentioned, I don't know if I adequately defined it, but the perennial philosophy is that there is one true god or one true truth across all religion and philosophy. So that's kind of extrapolating it to an idea with matter. And as all alchemy is, it's taking philosophical ideas and imputing it onto matter. So when you're reading these things, like the stars are going to have their influence if the, sh if the alchemical work is shaped into the cosmos. You're getting this early idea that everything is one, kind of like a Buddhist truth that everything is nothing or everything is one. You get in Hindu texts this idea of clear light and the oneness of everything, the unifying soul. It goes back to even Isaac Newton, who said, well, I don't know if he said it outright, but he believed that matter was alive and connected to the world soul. It's all just a separate connection of the same thing. But more interesting than that is the idea that the cosmos can interact with man on this small scale only if he gets the essence right. I think that's something that's really fascinating. I don't think it's something mirrored as much in physical truths today. And it is looking at the world in a really magical, intuitive way that if you can kind of mirror the essence, then the effects will be mirrored as well. But it also goes to the core tenet of alchemy, which is unifying opposites and, and, and creating balance among everything. Like we said, there's the quaternities, which is the balancing of each object almost vertically and horizontally, you could imagine. This is the same thing, just with scale. You're unifying the macrocosm and the microcosm and turning it into one holistic experience. Because that's the whole process of alchemy, is unification, or conjunctio. So next up, we have the Royal Habsburg Alchemists. I've read that wrong. It is the Habsburg Court of Royal Alchemists. The core alchemical process can sometimes be lost throughout the grandiose claims of eternal life and tinctures of Kiral. Turning lead to gold seems trivial in comparison. The Habsburgs, one of the most distinguished royal houses of Europe, was facing financial ruin during the early 17th centuries from expenses of maintaining a massive empire. In an effort to gain immense financial returns with nearly no overhead, the Habsburgs hired Johann Joachim Becker, a major economist and alchemist alike, to save the family from ruin. Amulets arose that claimed to be lead or silver transmuted into gold, but the process was never actually successful. While alchemy failed to pay derivatives, new metallurgical technologies emerged as a result that proved beneficial in later mining operations. That's one of my favorite things about alchemy is that it feels like a piece of lore that you could find in a work from Tolkien, but it's something that really happened and it gets imbued into all these actual historical events. The Habsburgs were facing financial ruin from ruling Spain in the 17th century because the empire was so large, so they thought, what can we do to get all this money back? And they said, turning anything into gold would be pretty good. It's literally like King Midas. So they actually hire this guy and they get a court of royal alchemists going that are trying day and night to turn lead to gold to save them from financial ruin. And a fun fact is that all the major economists in the 17th century were also alchemists, so make of that what you will about the economists of the day. And almost exactly like the gunpowder story, they didn't find gold, obviously, but they found some processes that could be useful later on and were actually profitable. I couldn't find exactly what the metallurgical processes were, but I'm assuming it's something with distilling iron as that was prevalent within the region. But it's always fun to see alchemy get tied into these greater historical narratives and to see that people thought this was a genuine way to make money and a genuine way to interact with the world. You kind of look back and think, people always thought of mythology as mythology. Stories are grandiose ways to explain the world, but when you hear things like this and realize it was actual a genuine experience that people believe, it, it changes the narratives. It's so interesting and it makes you think, when you go into the future, what will people then say about what we thought now? You can't believe that that was actually real because it just would seem so foolish. But we're going even farther back for the next one, and we have Taoism. Taoism is a Chinese naturalist philosophy and religion, a combination of both aspects into a cohesive worldview that man must live in harmony with nature. Taoist practice is directly associated with many esoteric works, alchemy the core of which we are concerned. A key discipline in many schools, 
Alchemical work is found as a means to purify the soul. It's seen as a spiritual discipline more than materialist expedition. Taoism developed forms of philosophical alchemy akin to the hermetic practices. Core figures involved Lu Dongxiong, the founder of Naidan, or internal alchemy. Internal alchemy is concerned with increasing qi in the body, consisting of extreme breathwork and vitalization. This is a really early comparison to what I would say Jung's work kind of looks like. Um, within Taoism, there was internal alchemy and external alchemy, as you remember, with the Pill of Immortality. So some people were using it as a, like Freemasonry, as a cornerstone for spiritual progress, but some people actually believed you could find gold. This was what, I, I believe that Tao Hongjin, who we mentioned earlier, was a Taoist. It was really prevalent, it was really prevalent within China. A lot of people were really interested, as we saw with Chinese alchemical elixir poisoning, but more philosophically, I think it's so fascinating to see, as well as alchemy being woven into historical narratives, being woven into religious narratives. Qi is a very central part of the Taoist philosophy, this kind of essence of nature, but you can also improve it through this alchemical work. So people saw this transmutation, this process-based thing of alchemy, and made use of it relative to their own core philosophies. We'll see that more with Rasa Q. <laughs> Rosicrucianism. Rosicrucianism is an amalgamation of occult practices, a blend of Hermeticism, Jewish Kabbalah, Christian Gnosticism, and alchemical work. Arising near the mid-17th century as a result of two anonymous manifesto publications, the movement soon grabbed public following. Many were enchanted with the grandiose spiritual promises of universal reformations of mankind built on esoteric truths of the past. Symbolized by the rose crossed, Rosicrucians claimed to be a band of alchemists and sages whom were set to transform the world intellectually and spiritually, something of an old New World Order. Once again, the writings pointed towards a more spiritual form of alchemy than literal creation of gold, as no records exist of Rosicrucians claiming to literally turn lead into gold. This is such a cool thing that I'm happy I stumbled upon, because it's literally like an old New World Order. It is taking an all-star team of all the occult practices that came before you, Gnosticism, Kabbalah, Hermeticism, and Alchemy, and just making a mutt out of them, just kind of picking and choosing, and making the most esoteric, spiritually pure practice that you can find. I don't even- <laughs> spiritually pure is probably not the right word, I have no clue what these guys wanted, but it literally sounds like they were trying to make a new world order. And once again, people believed in it. There were hundreds of people that were coming through to learn about these alchemical truths, and as you've seen a kind of pattern emerge, alchemical truths kind of just get re-wrapped based on whatever religion they're going into, from Taoism to Hermeticism to now Rosicrucianism. It's the same thing, but they just kind of repackage it. Like this one's a special limited edition because we have Kabbalah and Gnosticism involved with it too. This is something I'd love to go into more in the future and get a more in-depth look at it because this is literally like some people coming and saying they're gonna overtake the world with spiritual practice and it's really cool. Um, but next up we have Louis de Venin. Louis was a French alchemist and toxicologist implicated in King Louis XIV's affair of poisons, a major murder scandal associated with paganism, poisoning, and witchcraft. So much of the aristocracy was implicated that a total of 36 high society members were executed. This came after the trial of Madame de Brinvalier, where her and her lover attempted to poison the French army captain, Brinvalier's father in order to take his estate. This led to open panic after the woman's affair, leading authorities to round up fortune tellers, diviners, and alchemists. Louis was an aristocrat who held ties to many of the nobles afflicted and outwardly claimed to have turned lead to gold. While initially set to the gallows for his association with the crimes, he was deemed too mentally ill to stand execution as he may speak on the murders which were trying to be covered up. This led to life imprisonment, of which he never turned lead to gold again. This is the craziest stray that's gonna get caught on this list. Imagine you're just some alchemist trying to practice in your basement, just like, man, I, I'm really close, I'm gonna get this gold next time, and you're lying about it in the, in the public sphere, and then someone comes knocking on your door, implicating you in a poison trial that you had absolutely nothing to do with, and you just go, insane because of it. So, um, the moral of that story is do not lie. This is such a fascinating and intricate story. It gets into this duke being murdered and there's like seven layers deep that I can't exactly go into right now. But it is so cool that alchemy got involved too, that they just thought, 
Yeah, I mean, he's someone to blame, so let's just toss these guys turning lead to gold involved in it. Louis de Venin was almost certainly not doing anything. He he, he don't, definitely didn't kill the guy, they were just rounding up people. But I, lo I love the idea of someone being too mentally ill in the 1600s to stand trial for execution, because he's just gonna get on the galleys and just start screaming at the top of his lungs that this guy was actually killed and he wasn't the one that did it and then it would start to spread rumors so they just it just locked him up forever after that back to more firmly grounded alchemy we have masa confusa according to some alchemists matter was not soulless or innately separate from life the negredo stage or the blackening referred to in the quaternities is the representation of chaos or what alchemists called the Masa Confusa. Alchemy is more than transforming nature, but going against the natural ordering of the universe, awakening some innate principle that lay latent. The former is represented by the raven, the latter is represented by the dove, two polarizing forces that are later unionized. The eradication of the Masa Confusa is the end of the lesser work, the purification of the vessel before unification. So now we're getting back to the actual alchemical process. As you can imagine, if you looked at it spiritually, this Masa Confusa is the initial issues, the initial problems that you have before you work. There's a lot of types of Masa Confusa, a lot of starting initial conditions that you can move through with the work. You can think of it like therapy. When you're coming in with some disorganized part of yourself, some chaos in your soul or in your spirit, you're starting with these initial conditions that need to be worked out. Their chaos needs to be reordered and you need to have some ritual purification. That's a more coherent example of the inner alchemical work that we're going to see later on. But this Masa Confusa goes back to the Alkahest. You want to disillusion or distill these properties into their purest forms and reorder them, which in and of itself is an incredibly hard task. That's why it's the first step of the lesser work. Because before you can turn the lead to gold, everything needs to be in their proper place. And once everything's in their proper place, and everything has been purified, you can then move from the ordering into the purification or into the transmutation. So finally, as our last step of tier 2, we have Mysterium Magnum. Mysterium Magnum refers to the great mystery of the divine and the spiritual universe. Bohm, a Christian mystic, used the term as a generality to discuss theological concepts and the spiritual underpinnings of the world, looking at how the divine is reflected in every aspect of creation. As such, Alchemists employed the term to denote primordial undifferentiated matter, the primordial assortment of elements unified in a primary mass before they could arise as separate entities. As if an Ouroboric cycle, the Mysterium Magnum is the starting and ending point of the alchemical process. So this is the starting point of the work along with Mus Confusa, this primordial undifferentiated matter, that is, the unification of everything but it's not yet in its proper form. You have lead mixed with gold, mixed with mercury. Like we said, with the psychological point of view, that's if you have all this chaos in your life and all these things that aren't going right and they're just a mess within yourself. But like the Ouroboric cycle, everything will still exist within you after that transmutation. It'll just be in a different form. This also goes back to the material aspect of God. It's a Gnostic and Kabbalistic idea that God is a physical presence that's interacting with the world. He's reflected in every aspect of material creation. You can find him in every process of the alchemical work, from the worst to the best, from Masa Confusa to the end of the Mysterium Magnum. He is the entire process and the entire transmutation. And as you get closer to him, you get closer to finishing the alchemical process. So I'm happy with leaving it off on that for the first part of the alchemy iceberg. If you've stayed along for this long, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And if you want to see part 2, feel free to stay around for next time. At this point, feel free to click off the video if you want, because I'm just going to be talking about some updates with respect to the channel, where I see it going, and what I want to be doing further. Alright, now that I got all my, my Tyler Borens here, I don't have a name. I don't know if you guys want a crowd name or if that's corny, but um, yeah. So, first of all, I've never gotten a chance to properly thank you all person to person for all the support that you've given me. So truly, truly, thank you. It means the most to me on every single video. I've gotten incredible commenters. I've gotten people that are showing me so much love and so much support that really make me want to keep putting out high quality content for you guys. Um, I hope you still think this is high quality. 
I just finished recording so I won't be able to see until the end product. I'm still getting really accustomed to in-person filming and it's just the, the setup, I built all of this, built all of this, like I built it. Um, it took a long, long time, longer than I expected. I had to get so much stuff figured out, but I really hope you guys appreciate it and I hope you guys like it more than anything. I think I'm gonna start doing more in-person filming videos more than uh, the video essays I was doing prior. It'll still be the same theme, but I think I can get a more, more personal connection and I can get across the more anecdotal kind of funny points to me that I want to get when I can talk about it in person. So I'm going to be working on the alchemy and psychology video after the iceberg finishes. Um, I think I'm getting across hopefully enough about alchemy. It's so confusing, but it's so fascinating. But yeah, I have a lot of a lot of stuff that I really want to do since I have all of the technical stuff worked out of what I need to be doing. I think I can get these videos out a lot faster. So you will not have to be waiting another month for a video if you've been waiting. And thank you to everyone in the Discord. Um, I don't, I don't know who you are. You have been so supportive and it means so much to me. If you're still around, please feel free to click on the link in the bio and join the Discord so I can talk to you all and we can talk about alchemy and all this stuff. But yeah, um, I hope you've all enjoyed this new style of video. Please, please, please let me know what you think. I'd be happy to hear if I could improve in any way or what you think just in general. I know it's different and I hope it's a good change that you all can be happy with. So I think that's it. Thank you, thank you so much again from the bottom of my heart for watching. I, I appreciate it so much and I hope to see you all later. Thank you again and I'll see you next time.